Well, hello, friends. Uh, Mark Milwee, uh, Trinity, Alabama, Mount View Baptist Church. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the uh, first half of Mark uh, chapter 6. So as you're uh, finding your Bible and turning there, let me remind you uh, that we finished up uh, chapter 4 and covered all of chapter 5 uh, last time. In that passage, we witnessed Jesus calm the sea, uh, heal a demoniac, cure the woman with the issue of blood, and, and bring a little girl back to life. All of these miracles remind us that nothing is uh, too difficult for our Savior. Uh, therefore, we should be quick to take all of our cares and concerns uh, uh, to Him. In fact, all of these stories that we studied last time admonished us to be people of faith. Uh, for instance, uh, when Jesus calmed the storm uh, there with the disciples, uh, the text says the disciples were filled with great fear and wonder. And Jesus said to them, why, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Uh, the healing of the demoniac, uh, who was filled with multiple demons, demonstrates Jesus' power uh, over the spiritual world. Uh, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood uh, uh, shows his power over the physical world, and, and it came as a direct result of her faith. In fact, Jesus says to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Uh, go in peace, be healed of your disease. And finally, the healing of the uh, young daughter of the synagogue official, Jairus, is an even greater example of faith because uh, when they came and they told Jairus uh, to leave the teacher alone, uh, the daughter is dead, uh, Jesus said to him, do not fear, uh, only believe. Well, he did, and Jesus proceeded to bring his little girl back uh, to life. Uh, these stories and the faith behind them are all very important because uh, of what we encounter uh, today at the beginning of chapter 6. Uh, look at how the chapter uh, begins. Uh, he, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. So they left uh, Capernaum and they traveled over to Nazareth, which was about a 20-mile journey. It probably took about a full day uh, to walk to, to make this uh, trek over there. Now pick up with uh, verse 2. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? Uh, what, what is this wisdom that has been given to him? Uh, how, how are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, uh, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Well, we're all familiar with that expression, uh, familiarity breeds contempt. In fact, I gave our lesson today that title. And we see an excellent example of it uh, here in these verses. The people in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth were not impressed with his wisdom or amazed by his miracles. Instead, they were filled with contempt and unbelief. Instead of rejoicing over the miracles and being amazed at his teaching, uh, they asked a series of contemptuous questions about where he got his credentials and, and how was he able to do all of these things. I, I like how one of my commentaries put it. It said, they knew him too well, but in reality, they didn't know him at all. Now look at Jesus' response, uh, beginning in verse 4. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Again, unfortunately, they did not uh, appreciate his abilities, and the text says that Jesus marveled at their unbelief. It also says he could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. Now, this doesn't mean that his power was limited by their unbelief. It means that their lack of faith prevented him from doing all the things he would have been happy to have done for them had they believed. It stands in sharp contrast to the calming of the sea and the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, the raising of the little girl from the dead, all in the previous chapter. Uh, in fact, someone put it this way. They said, unbelief and faith are opposites. If faith is the capacity to receive what God wants to give, unbelief is the willful refusal to receive what God wants to give. The SV Study Bible says this about this passage. It says, Jesus will not force his miracles on a hostile, skeptical audience. 
It stands in contradiction to the character and will of Jesus to heal where there is fundamental rejection of him or unbelief. It's also been pointed out that in verse 6, so where Jesus says, uh, where it says that Jesus marveled at their unbelief, or your translation might say he was amazed or astonished by their unbelief, this is one of only two times uh, this word is attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. The other time is found in Matthew chapter 8, where Jesus marvels or is astonished at the faith of the centurion, who of course was a Gentile. The text in Matthew 8, verse 10 says, When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So the irony is, is, is very hard to miss. It's ironic that Jesus could marvel at the faith of this centurion who was a Gentile, while at the same time marvel at the lack of faith of the people in his own hometown. But it does bring up a good question. Can we become so familiar with Jesus that we lose our sense of wonder and amazement by the things that he does? In other words, does our familiarity with Jesus uh, decrease our faith? I think back to the story that I shared with you last time about the pastor that was teaching a group of refugees about Jesus calming the sea and, and their astonishment that Jesus was able to do this. They were just blown away by his ability to calm the storm. And you might recall that the pastor said, I suddenly realized that they grasped the full meaning of the story better than I did. We have a tendency, listen, if we're not careful, of missing the wonder and awe and beauty of the miracles and all the events in the Bible because we are so familiar with them. So the first lesson today to take away, to take away and apply to our lives is not to let our familiarity with Jesus cause us to miss the awe and wonder of Jesus. The fact that Jesus could calm the storm, heal the man filled with a multitude of demons, cure a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, I bring a little girl back to life. All of these events should strengthen our faith and cause us to be amazed and in awe of his majesty and glory. I think of the song that we uh, would often sing in the church uh, when I was younger. We sang, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song will ever be. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Well, amen. Now let's look at verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, uh, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So let me remind you, uh, before we talk about uh, these uh, verses, uh, about the initial calling of the disciples back in Mark chapter 1. In Mark 1, 17, Jesus says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then in Mark chapter 3, uh, we're told that Jesus, as he chose these disciples, had two purposes in mind. It says, And he appointed the twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out uh, to preach. So they were selected with a plan in mind. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. But then this plan had a twofold purpose or a twofold pattern that was to be uh, followed. They were to spend time with Jesus and then go out and preach. Uh, this is God's pattern for discipleship. We're called to him, uh, to be equipped by him, and then we're sent out to be his representatives. In, in other words, we come in that we might go out. This has been God's plan from the very beginning. But the problem is we've stopped going out. Uh, my uh, preacher's commentary says someplace along the line of historical development, the church lost its identity as a pilgrimage and became a church in place. It then asked this question, has the church become a company of squatters rather than a caravan of pilgrims? What spiritual values have we lost when we quit moving? 
Are we fighting old battles and battering time-worn barriers? These are significant questions because Jesus gives his disciples a personal model for their ministry. We come in to be equipped for ministry so that we can then go out and do the ministry. Uh, Christianity is a religion on the move. We are told to go, but most of us would rather stay. Most of our church growth problems would be solved if we would actually see the fields as white unto harvest and then go out in the fields and do something about it. This is what Jesus did with the disciples. Uh, so some might say, well, were they ready to go? Probably not. Did they want to stay with him? I'm sure they did. W were they fully trained? Uh, no, but there's some things you can only learn on the job. So Jesus paired them up and sent them out. But he didn't send them out empty-handed. He sent them out with authority. I look again at verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. The word authority comes from a word that literally means the right to exercise power. So they watched Jesus cast out demons. Now he gives them the authority and or the power to do the same. It should also be pointed out that we are being sent out with this same authority. Uh, Jesus introduces the Great Commission by saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So we are being sent out with his authority. This is the exact same word that Jesus used with the disciples when he sent them out. So, so we're not going out in our own strength, but in the strength and authority of our Savior. Then, beginning with verse 8, Jesus tells them what to take with them, what not to take, uh, how to go about their mission. Uh, someone has pointed out that uh, the overriding principles that come out of these instructions are the principles of urgency and dependency. Urgency and dependency. We see the urgency of the mission in that uh, we're told not to waste time on those who are plainly not interested. Uh, look carefully at verse 11. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. The, the shaking off of the feet after traveling to a Gentile region was a common Jewish custom in Jesus' day. It symbolized removing the filth or sin from your life that you might have picked up by being uh, uh, around these uh, people. However, Jesus takes this custom and gives it a new and a different meaning. It now represents a warning to anyone who rejects the good, the good news. It's no longer symbolic of removing sin or filth from your life, but it is symbolic of the judgment that will come upon those who reject the message of Christ. We actually see this principle in practice in Acts chapter 13, when Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch. Uh, uh, beginning with verse 44 of Acts 13, the Bible says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews uh, saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, uh, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, uh, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, as many were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of that district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I want to be careful in what I say here because I don't want you to misunderstand what I am trying to communicate. But sometimes, listen, we need to shake the dust off of our feet and move on. There are people out there who are eager to hear the gospel, just like the Gentiles in this passage I just read to you. So we need to go out there and find them. For instance, maybe you have a friend or a loved one that you've been trying to reach for years. I'm not saying that you should abandon your friend or give up on your loved one. You should keep praying and keep talking to them as God gives you the opportunity. 
But maybe God is saying it's okay to look around and see if there's someone else that you should focus some of your time and attention on. This is what Jesus did. He moved on from place to place. This is what Paul and Barnabas did. They moved on from place to place. This is also what Jesus is now telling his disciples to do, to move from place to place. If that neighbor across the street will not listen to you, then talk to the neighbor down the street. There is a sense of urgency about the mission. So we don't have a lot of time to waste on people that don't want to hear the message, but there is also a dependency upon God that we see in these instructions. Uh, furthermore, the disciples were told to travel light and depend upon God. They were encouraged to trust God for their food and, and, and their lodging and just get busy and go and do the work. They were sent out two by two so they could help each other and encourage each other. But they were, they were cast out and told to go. Now, you probably don't remember it, but it, I do because it really stuck with me. Back when we studied Mark chapter 3, verse 14, where Jesus gave them this twofold pattern of spending time with him and then being sent out uh, by him to preach, the, the word translated sent is it, it's a violent word. It, it carries the idea of being thrust out, uh, like a mother bird pushing her babies out of the nest when it's time uh, to fly. She does this because if they stay in the nest, they'll never learn to fly. Being pushed out of our comfort zone forces us to depend upon God and listen, that's where the growth happens in our Christian life. And we have ever reason to believe that this is exactly what happened with the disciples. Look at verses 12 and 13. So they went out and proclaimed uh, that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So if the goal of a disciple is to be like their teacher, then we can say that the disciples did a great job. They went out preaching a message of repentance. That they also went out, excuse me, the Bible says casting out many demons and, and they anointed many of the sick and the Bible says they healed them. Uh, excuse me, they were following the path uh, set out for them uh, by Jesus. They were equipped for ministry and then they went out to do the ministry. So we need to follow uh, this uh, same pattern uh, today. Now look at the uh, text beginning in verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said it, it, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, I'm sure somewhere along the line, you've heard the familiar outline. Uh, sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. We certainly see this outline play out in King Herod's life. The Herod in question here is uh, Herod Antipas, uh, the son of Herod the Great. His father ruled over the entire region until his death, uh, sometime during the early childhood of Jesus. His father is also the one that the Magi visited. The father is the one who ordered all the babies in and around Bethlehem to be slaughtered. Uh, he is also the one who died, and the angel told Joseph it was now safe to return from Egypt where he had fled with Mary and the baby. Uh, Herod the Great had already divvied up the land between his three sons before his death. Herod Antipas was over the region of Galilee and Perea. Judea and Samaria were ruled over by Archelaus, and the northeastern territories were given to uh, Philip. Philip was married to Herodias, but at some point his brother, Herod Antipas, decided that he wanted her for his wife. Of course, this was scandalous because it was not only adultery, but it was also a terrible abuse of power, and it set a horrible example for the people. And of course, all this did not happen in a vacuum, and John the Baptist had the courage to stand up and challenge the king on his immorality, and as a result, he ended up in prison. Uh, look at the text beginning in verse 17. For it was Herod uh, who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly." 
So the text indicates that Herod uh, realized the guilt of his sin, but he was not courageous enough to do anything about it. He knew and understood his wife held a grudge against John the Baptist, but he protected him because Herod saw John the Baptist as a righteous and a holy man. And even though he was convicted whenever he heard him preach, uh, the text says he heard him gladly. He represents so many in our world uh, today who are perplexed by their sin, but they don't have enough courage uh, to do anything about it. In fact, one of my commentaries put it this way. It says, uh, Herod, Herod's cowardice contrast directly with John's courage. And again, we clearly see our outline in his life. Uh, sin took him further than he wanted to go. It, it kept him longer than he wanted to stay. It cost him more than he wanted to pay. So we see the tragic outcome of all this in, uh, beginning with verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and, and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. We're all familiar with this story. We've, we've all heard of it. Uh, we, we know... Uh, uh, about it, uh, but the tragedy of it all is that John the Baptist, the, the man Jesus once said had no equal, died simply because Herod did not have the courage to swallow his pride in front of his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. He could have taken back his rash vow. He could say, he could say oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, that, that will not do. But instead, he, he beheaded a righteous and holy man so that he would not lose face. This is why sometime later, when he heard about the ministry of Jesus, he immediately assumed and jumped to the conclusion that it must be John the Baptist come back to life. He was haunted by his sin and stymied by his guilt. Someone put it this way. They said, ghosts of sins past inhabit the world of the guilty. Now, let me repeat that. Ghosts of sins past inhabit the world of the guilty. This is why we need to deal with our sins and confess them to the Lord. This is why we need to seek forgiveness. Otherwise, we relive those sins over and over and over again. This is the tragedy of Herod's life and unfortunately the lesson that he never learned because you see it was Herod Antipas that Pilate sent Jesus to just before he died. But instead of seeking forgiveness from the one who could have cleansed him, he ridiculed and mocked him and sent him back to Pilate uh, to be crucified. Because listen, sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Well, thank you for watching today. May God bless you.